you really want to be a fool, underestimate the power of wind and water. The flooding was just unbelievable. Houses on top of cars. We have to care about what we're doing to the planet. Bigger storms coming. It changed the face of government. The hurricanes had the most political fallout of any hurricane in the country's history. more than we realize weather decides our destiny in our daily existence and in the pages of history there are millions of instances moments both epic and fleeting where weather has made its impact on science politics combat sports and pop culture it has won wars created nations encouraged innovations and even influences what we wear I'm Harry Connick jr. welcome to the 100 biggest weather moments in this final hour, we'll reveal our top 12. These are the moments that have most inspired the human spirit, moments that have altered forever the way we live in our world, and moments that have at times moved so many of us to tears. Before we begin, let's take a quick look back at our list from the last hour. As a publisher, politician, and scientist, he might be the most versatile and accomplished man in history. Benjamin Franklin helped draft the Declaration of Independence, authored a famous almanac, founded the first volunteer fire department, invented bifocals, swim fins, and even a wood-burning stove that is still in use today. But out of all of his legendary achievements, to meteorologists, he will always be remembered for one thing above all others, flying a kite. Even though Ben Franklin had no formal education past the age of 10, his varied accomplishments are now legendary. His most famous experiment in 1752, using a kite to coax lightning from a thunderstorm, revealed insights into one of nature's most mysterious elements. Ben Franklin confirmed what was the nature of lightning. Uh, people knew static electricity. You slide across the floor and you get a spark of electricity. Ben Franklin proved that, yes, lightning was a gigantic form of that kind of electricity, static electricity. He opened a door there to, to understanding the electrical nature of, uh, of thunderstorms. Once Ben Franklin understood then the nature of lightning, he was able to propose the lightning rod as a way to avoid being struck or have houses that were being struck and burned down because of lightning. The importance of lightning rods is still felt today. Tall buildings like the Empire State Building are struck as many as 500 times a year. In Franklin's experiment, he was flirting with disaster. If indeed Franklin did do this experiment, he did not get a full lightning blast to occur on that cord. He got enough static charge to build up that it induced a current, but it was not a full-blown lightning strike on the kite. The temperature in the lightning bolt itself for a brief instant can be five times hotter than the temperature of the sun. He's lucky that he ever got to France to help us win the uh, Revolutionary War. I wouldn't recommend that anybody try to duplicate what he did. Uh, in fact, other people after Ben Franklin supposedly did this, did try it, and they died, several of them, which, of course, reinforces the idea that Ben Franklin was a very smart man. By 1767, the importance of his experiment was being compared to that of Isaac Newton, high praise for an amateur scientist. He had a fascination with weather that made for some of the best discoveries in meteorology that, that we have even still today. I don't know if I'd call him the father of American meteorology, but uh, he's definitely the great uncle. We know now that the sun is 
extremely dangerous. So you have to have protection. So you've got something called the UV Index. First devised in Canada in 1992, the UV Index is now a worldwide standardized method of providing daily forecasts to the public of the expected risk of overexposure to the sun. Responding to the frightening explosion of skin cancer caused by harmful UV or ultraviolet rays coming from the sun, it has become a first line of defense in combating America's number one form of cancer. This year in the United States, there are going to be over one million cases of skin cancer diagnosed. If you're sun sensitive and you know that your UV is high that day, then you know what to do. The index predicts UV intensity levels on a scale of 0 to 11 and above, where 0 indicates a minimal risk of overexposure, and 11 means an extremely high risk. During dangerous episodes, there are basic steps to being sun smart, including the use of sunscreen with SPF, sun protection factor. When I get up in the morning, even if it's cloudy outside, I put on sun protection. Everybody should wear sunscreen, even in the winter. People don't realize, but very important. I would hope that our idea is changing, that it's not cool anymore to be in the sun and have that dark tan. I usually tell patients that a tan is a precancerous glow. In addition to the crucial protection provided, rubbing in the sunscreen can also be a meaningful ritual. There's that mom that is lathering up that four-year-old kid from head to toe, and he's completely white with sunscreen. And then there's, you know, then there's the boyfriend who's putting the sunscreen on his girlfriend, and you're like, wow. Well, I'd say that that's a part of the honeymoon phase of the relationship. Oh, honey, let me apply that for you. Let me, let me do that for you. To, uh, oh, hey, don't, don't forget to put that sunscreen on. You'll, you'll, you'll burn like you always do. Isn't it wonderful? We have a love-hate relationship with the sun. We need it, but we only need a certain amount of it. Who needs to really bake in the sun anymore? You can still enjoy the beach, you can still enjoy the sunshine, but you gotta do it safely. There wasn't exactly an etiquette book for the behavior of tornadoes, but before the spring of 1974, meteorologists thought they had a pretty good handle on how a twister would and should act in certain situations. But as our next weather moment proves, Twisters really are the scariest things on Earth. For 24 hours that April, a swarm of tornadoes terrorized 13 states east of the Mississippi and had scientists rethinking everything they knew about the killer storms. More tornadoes aren't better for people, but more tornadoes are better for our understanding. The United States experiences more tornadoes per year than any other place on the Earth. But because of their short fuse and violent nature, these rotating columns of air had confounded scientists through most of the 20th century. Then one spring day in 1974, Mother Nature administered an unforgettable lesson when she laid siege to nearly half the country with the largest single outbreak of tornadoes in the recorded history of the world. This was the perfect storm of the tornado world. Just a monster of a jet stream came blasting in from the Pacific. And then like a wave, it broke right over the central U.S., just east of the Rockies. An event, the magnitude of which has not been approached. The name tells the story. Uh, it was the super outbreak. 148 tornadoes in a period of 24 hours. It affected areas all the way from Canada to near the Gulf of Mexico. These were long track tornadoes. The damage was just extraordinary. Buzzed through a number of communities, small and large, uh, leaving just trails of death and destruction along the way. The record high number of tornadoes wreaked havoc through the Midwest and parts of the South. But it was the amount of high intensity twisters that made this event so devastating. The Fujita scale goes from zero to five. Zero, the weakest, five, the strongest. The super outbreak brought 148 tornadoes of which 30 were F4 or F5, and six were F5. I mean, we go years now where we don't see any fives, and to have that many in one outbreak, whew, that's bad. This was a massive tornado outbreak of major, big, violent tornadoes. Xenia, Ohio, was the one tornado that probably caused more deaths than any other single tornado that particular outbreak. The place was devastated, and I in particular to remember uh, a, a, a school uh, the walls collapsing. It certainly did a job on the city. It just tore right through it, and uh, major buildings were no uh, 
no resistance to it. Legendary tornado expert Ted Fujita surveyed the aftermath of the Xenia, Ohio damage and proclaimed its F5 to be the strongest he'd ever studied. But as Fujita traveled to numerous other outbreak sites, he was able to make historic observations in the study of tornadoes, as well as to dispel many misconceptions. All the old myths that people had were just debunked that day. There were myths that tornadoes can't cross rivers. They cross the Ohio River in several places. Tornadoes were thought to not go through big metropolitan areas. That is not the case. For example, blasted some of the suburbs of Cincinnati, Ohio with an F5 tornado. They blasted through the mountains of West Virginia and Western North Carolina at thousands of feet of elevation. In April 3rd and 4th, there were so many of them. They did all of those things. These are all things that aren't documented all that well. But when you have a big outbreak and they're all over the place, uh, they were documented extremely well. The super outbreak was a kind of a turning point, I think, in beginning to understand microbursts and tornadoes, and it really led to a lot of the modern advances that we enjoy today. Coming up on the 100 biggest weather moments. Without it, we were blind, and literally blind. Suddenly, in a matter of minutes, you had 10 feet of water coursing through downtowns. That flood is what pushed them, the blues up north. mighty Mississippi River. Over time, man has done its best to tame America's most famous waterway, but when push comes to shove, Old Man River is gonna hit back, hard. When it flooded in 1927, the surging waters not only washed away lives and thousands of acres of southern land, it altered forever this country's political landscape. The 1927 flood really changed the politics, really the geopolitics of America. This was not just an event of the lower Mississippi River Valley. This was a, 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 an event of national importance. The rain started in the summer of 1926 and continued into the spring of 1927. For months, thousands of residents in the Mississippi River floodplain fought to hold the river within a complicated system of levees. But when the levee at Mounds, Mississippi finally broke on April 21st, 1927, the battle was lost. The flooding was just unbelievable. Um, whole towns just went under, from started with just inches of water and suddenly in a matter of minutes you had 10 feet of water coursing through downtowns throughout the Delta. Like a perfect machine, the river rolled over the Delta, reclaiming its territory, becoming an angry white cap sea 60 miles wide. The shocked inhabitants headed for rooftops, tree limbs, and the highest ground they could find as a churning, filthy brown foam covered the land, eating away at everything in its path. Greenville, Mississippi essentially wiped off the map. Um, one very dramatic scene, you had 13,000 poor African Americans clinging to trees and going to tops of bridges as water just filled the whole um, um, delta, and eventually those people had to be rescued. 145 levees ultimately gave way in the most important river flood in U.S. history. America would never be the same. Much like what happened with Katrina, the government had to come in and try to get these people back together, get the levees repaired, and try to rebuild lives. And he started getting really the buildup of the modern levee system. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers trying to control Old Man River. Prior to the flood, Republican stalwart Herbert Hoover's political fortunes had been fading, but his masterful handling of the relief effort catapulted him to the presidency in 1928. Overseeing 154 tent cities for some 300,000 victims, he was dubbed the Great Humanitarian. He came down here and started offering government relief to people, ways to help people start a new life. The sympathetic national response was in direct contrast to many local efforts. In New Orleans, nervous city fathers wanted to dynamite the levees to divert flood water around upscale parts of the city. They persuaded poorer residents by promising full compensation for losses. Standby viewers of the Weather Channel, they went down, they blew the levee up, they flooded these people and never gave them a nickel. Following the flood, new laws gave the federal government primary responsibility for flood control on the Mississippi. The aftermath brought about cultural changes as well. Triggered a lot of ways of migration from the south to the north as people look for new jobs and new opportunities. You go to Chicago today, the blues clubs are known all over the world. That goes right back to the 27 flood. Uh, those blues clubs didn't start on the north side of Chicago. They started in Memphis and Chattanooga and down there. And that flood is what pushed them, the blues, up north. African-American voting allegiances also began a gradual shift from Republican Party to Democratic when promises made to black leaders during the flood were 
were ignored by Hoover. That began the exodus from African Americans who were loyal to the Republican Party, the party of Abe Lincoln, the party of emancipation. It began moving them over to the Democratic Party. But the single most important political impact of the flood was how Americans viewed their national government. People start believing that the government has a um, role in protecting them from natural disasters. Probably was a, the single event that was responsible for the sort of creation of the New Deal in the federal government I as much as any single event in American history. It changed the face of government for the 20th century because of a flood. For centuries, meteorology was more of a guessing game than a science. With no real data at their fingertips, weather watchers could only use techniques that, in hindsight, greatly limited the chance for a reliable forecast. That all changed with our next moment, a 400-year-old invention that gave mankind its first measurements of Mother Nature and helped us take the first step in an ongoing journey to understand the world around us. In the grand scheme of all inventions, the thermometer marks the beginning of scientific meteorology. You know, back then where there were thermometers and it was 110 degrees, it was just hot and you dealt with it. Hot or cold is not just a matter of comfort. Our lives depend on it. When 17th century astronomer Galileo Galilei filled a glass tube with liquid to measure the temperature of the air, he gave mankind power over the environment. Everyone wants to know what's the temperature. Is it hot? Is it cold? It's the first thing everyone does in the morning. When I was a kid, it was just go look at the thermometer, see how cold it was. What does that mean? Well, what are you going to dress for? What are you going to wear to school today? We get a sense of that feeling, that sense of what it's going to be like when we walk out of the door. Are you in a sweater today or are you in a tank top? Once you get the idea, okay, mercury goes up and down in the tube, we can put a scale on it, and then, then we can really say, you know, how hot it is or how cold it is. There was a number of proposals by very distinguished scientists to try to give it a scale. Uh, some people used uh, uh, quantities like the boiling point of butter. Merely observing the rise and fall of liquid in a tube is meaningless without a standardized scale. Fortunately, meteorology took a quantum leap forward in the 18th century when Anders Celsius and Gabriel Fahrenheit devised scales that allowed scientists around the world to make meaningful measurements. However, since the 1960s, the United States has become the only industrial country still using the Fahrenheit scale, putting American weather forecasters in an interesting situation. It's a bit of a dichotomy. Uh, we sort of work at the surface in Fahrenheit, but our upper air observations we work with in Celsius. So we're kind of a bipolar uh, meteorological community. The fact that the, the thermometer gives us this quantification and it allows us to uh, comprehend the flow of heat in our lives, I think it's very important. Coming up on the 100 biggest weather moments. I thought this was going to be the big one. Never underestimate Mother Nature. There are no words that can describe what it's like to see that with your own eyes. It sounds impossible for mere mortals. Break down the complexity of Mother Nature into a set of equations. Yet scientists are in the process of performing that very monumental mathematical task. However, turning a thunderstorm into a series of numbers can create billions of bits of information. And when you need a computer to crunch those kinds of numbers, a desktop just won't do. It's one of our most important tools right now in trying to understand what our Earth is going to look like in the future. They are our crystal ball. For decades, scientists dreamed of predicting weather with math, observe the state of atmosphere, then calculate change using the laws of physics and thermodynamics. Unfortunately, there were just too many calculations. However, in 1950, the dream took a giant step toward reality when the first weather forecast was made using a primitive supercomputer known as the ENIAC. The ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, and it was actually created to help develop the hydrogen Bomb. It was a vacuum tube uh, computer, uh, gigantic, certainly less powerful than the uh, computer you have in your digital watch. The forecast actually wasn't very good and they ran into all kinds of problems, but that was the beginning. Today, the biggest supercomputers still will fill a large room, but they're the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of desktop PCs. One of the most powerful computers on the planet is what's called the Earth Simulator in Yokohama, Japan. It does 40 trillion calculations a second. The exploding power of supercomputers is leading an astounding revolution.
evolution. Today, scientists are literally feeding every physical property of our planet into supercomputers. Their goal? A virtual Earth living inside a computer. You write millions of lines of computer code and you create a twin Earth. We have to assimilate a lot of data, uh, 211 million observations per day. A computer pretends to be the weather, um, but it can pretend to be the weather a lot faster than the weather really happens. You want to get all these forecasts done in about an hour and a half, so you need the largest computers in the world to make the forecast that you read about in the papers, see on television, or hear about on the radio. Supercomputers are also paving the way to climate predictions. You create a climate model and you run it on a supercomputer, and you try to figure out what the world is going to look like in the future. And that is done through the use of um, solving equations, but it's done on a global basis. The next generation of supercomputers able to do thousands of trillions of calculations per second holds out the dream of accuracy unimaginable only a few years ago. That's the dream and, and getting much more to what I, I would call precision weather. Not just a general forecast, but precisely where and when and what type of weather, when's it going to start, when's it going to stop. We'll be able to see not only a tornado, but the individual whirls of wind inside them. We think probably in the next five years we will have an abundance of those machines, so it will really we think lead to dramatic improvements in weather forecasting. Coming up on the 100 biggest weather moments. The thermostat brought great control and great control issues. After the flush toilet, I would say air conditioning is the finest invention of all time. Welcome back to The Countdown. Growing up in the Deep South, I can't imagine spending too many summer days without our next weather moment standing by, because after spending time out in the high summer sun, walking into a room that had it cranked on was like walking into paradise. First used to entice patrons into cool theaters, this revolutionary invention would go on to transform regions once thought too hot to inhabit. We used to have those window air conditioners. God, the joy of that thing was just unbelievable. Puts a smile on my face during the summertime. After the flush toilet, I would say air conditioning is the finest invention of all time. I can tell you what's bad about air conditioning is when it doesn't work. We're so used to it, if we don't have it, we're lost. Willis Carrier was a 26-year-old fresh out of college engineer from New York when he patented the world's first mechanical air conditioning system in 1902. The young genius received a flash of insight while standing in a fog waiting for a train. It gave him an understanding of the relationship between temperature, humidity, and dew point that spawned the modern air conditioning industry. Before Carrier's invention, life in America was very different, especially in America's southern regions. The way that houses were built had to be built hugely kind of inefficient because you'd have to have a big breezeway and you'd have 16-foot ceilings. In terms of commerce, you lost a lot of the summertime. When I was a boy, uh, and on brutally hot summers, uh, one of the treats was every Saturday we would go to the movies because they were air conditioned. They were the first institutional places to have air conditioning, so people would go to the movies and sit there all day. I taught school in, in you know, come May, in September, it was hard to get kids to concentrate. Just think about sweating. A man would wear a shirt and you'd be soaking wet within a matter of seconds. Thank God for air conditioning because now my suits don't look like I'd wet on myself before I got to church. Carrier gained international fame as he continued to improve air conditioning technology. By 1928, his company's slogan was weather makers to the world. Air conditioning expanded to office buildings, manufacturing plants, government spaces, sports facilities, and ultimately to private homes and even cars. Today, his invention permeates and transforms American life. It's virtually changed the way that we deal with our country. It's created the boom in the Sun Belt. Air conditioning in the Deep South was akin to like having heating in, in Minneapolis. Phoenix would have 40,000 people in it today if we didn't have air conditioning. Instead, we have air conditioning and there are 3.5 million people that live here. Until the invention of air conditioning, people would die of heat prostration. Air conditioning is an incredibly important development uh, that without it, we would not have modern day supercomputers. Thermostats, mm -hmm. huge. What would, what could air, would air conditioning be without a thermostat? The thermostat brought great control and great control issues. Who controls a thermostat is a huge issue in our house. My husband and I have laughed and argued for years about our air conditioning. He likes it colder, I like it warmer. He turns it down too much. In the middle of the night, I turn it back up. I think we need to put all wives in charge of the world's thermostat. 
And then the global warming will just level right out. So who controls it? I don't know. Whoever falls to sleep first. As the raging North Atlantic battered his ship, 22-year-old John Newton was certain his end was near. But in the face of the overpowering forces of nature, this simple sailor found himself overwhelmed by the presence of a higher power. His salvation from the elements proved to be a turning point in his life, moving him to join the ministry and compose one of the most enduring and spiritual songs of all time. In the end, a storm that threatened to take one man's life would end up saving millions more. In the spring of 1748, a young English sailor found himself in the midst of a violent gale in the North Atlantic. He watched a comrade washed overboard to his death as the waves pounded higher, threatening to break the ship apart. In mortal fear for his life, he did something he had never done before. He screamed out for mercy from above. When the storm finally abated, John Newton had been spared, and his life would never be the same. Years later, Newton, who became one of England's foremost churchmen, composed a hymn about his deliverance from the storm. Amazing grace. A violent storm uh, changes not just one man's life, but really uh, changed an expression of believers that endures to this day. Here's another case of where the weather affected one person in such a way and ever since touched so many people in so many ways. I once was lost. Amazing Grace has become a kind of national hymn in this country and is sung worldwide. Amazing Grace is, is the one song that, that you learn. I think that's probably the first song you learn in church. Well, Amazing Grace is, is so much more than a song. I think it gives a physical feeling. Was grace that taught my heart to fear. Amazing grace is something that you kind of feel like it gives you a direct line to the other side. It is truly the voice of mankind talking to God. It's pretty simple poetry. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing particularly profound. It's in the singing of the song that transforms the song from simple poetry on paper to something that changes the way you feel about everything in your life. I think the thing we're talking about here is power. And if you really want to be a fool, underestimate the power of wind and water. The song was written by a slave trader who came to terms with the immorality of uh, making human beings cargo. And in the middle of this storm, he came to terms with God's grace. If you've been in something such as a hurricane, it's so large, it's so mysterious. It's very hard not to feel within oneself the presence of God. There are people who still uh, say that their lives and their faith uh, were not only strengthened, but it almost came into existence because of that song. It has changed lives. How interesting, though, that it was born out of a storm. Is it the greatest song ever written? I would have to vote for that one. You can see and learn a lot from a bird's eye view, and this next weather moment provided scientists with the ultimate lofty perch. Ask any meteorologist the significance of April 1st, 1960, and he'll tell you it was the day man got his first out of this world look at storm systems and pushed weather forecasting into the space age forever. The invention of meteorological satellites, uh, by far, in my opinion, the, the greatest breakthrough uh, in modern times. That gave us the perspective from on high. Satellite allows us to see bigger storms coming, and without it, we were blind, and literally blind. Hundreds of people, if not thousands of people's lives are saved because you've got this thing that's orbiting around the Earth. By the 1950s, meteorology had made great strides in forecasting, but limitations in technology left scientists dreaming of a vantage point from which to see the entire planet's weather. On April 1, 1960, the dream took a quantum leap forward when NASA launched Tyros-1, the first weather satellite. I can't imagine what it was like the first time they saw the satellite images. They must have been in awe at what they were seeing. All of a sudden, 
you've got a clear picture of what's going on in the atmosphere. You finally see a hurricane for the first time. It's one thing to talk about the weather. It's one thing to draw something on a map. But to actually see the storms in motion and to see, uh, you know, something like Katrina and you see this monster bearing down on, on people, that became almost a living organism. The satellite basically allowed us to see everything. We can see weather systems moving from one place to another. Looking down from above, we began to see that the weather was behaving the way we had thought it would with the storm systems marching across the country. But for the first time then, we had the ability to really start to put it all together. You've got this lead time of five, six, seven, even eight days of, of storms unfolding and, and moving. We can look on satellites right now and see exactly what's coming and make a careful prediction. When I see those satellite images of a big storm that's cranking or a hurricane that's cranking, it tells you so much about the storm. The satellites now can detect things like wind. They can detect how much moisture is in a cloud. Now we can even see through clouds to the ocean surface with some sensors. Uh, we can measure rainfall from these satellites. It's just unbelievable what we can do with them. The 1900 hurricane in Galveston, you didn't have a Tiros one. So we lost 8,000 people. Hurricanes are the costliest natural disaster the U.S. faces. Without satellites, there'd be more loss of life, there'd be more damage than there is even now. So it's one of those weather instruments that we've got now that we're never going to get rid of. Coming up in our top three biggest weather moments. It would have probably led to a German victory in World War II. The flooding that you saw almost exclusively was not supposed to happen. Complete shock at what Mother Nature had done. Welcome back. There are some weather forecasts that help you determine if you need to take an umbrella to work. Then there are those that can impact the course of history, or in the case of our next moment, help determine the fate of the free world. General Dwight D. Eisenhower valued the opinions of his chief meteorologist as much as his military commanders when he set in motion the massive invasion he prayed would turn the tide in World War II. The forecasts on and around D-Day were the most important forecasts ever made. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. It was to be the largest air, land, and sea operation in history. General Dwight D. Eisenhower and the Allied forces were Europe's last hope to escape the clutches of Nazi Germany. To coordinate some 5,000 ships, 11,000 airplanes, and over 150,000 soldiers required a delicate balance of high tides and calm weather. On the eve of June 6, 1944, the invasion that took two years to plan had come down to one rainy day. The window for good weather for the Normandy invasion was very, very narrow, simply because during that time of the year, there are storms that move through every few days. June on the English Channel in Normandy, sometimes there were good days and sometimes there were bad days. Because you were going to do massive landing operations, you had to do it when the tides were right. This vast armada, thousands and thousands of troops, landing craft tanks and landing craft infantry. You had to have uh, the tide at a certain level and you had to have the wave action at a certain level for it to be safe. Missing the tides would delay the invasion another two weeks. A team of meteorologists led by Captain James Stagg worked around the clock to find a pause in the rain. Well, for Stagg, it was an enormous burden and uh, he debated it uh, in his own mind, realizing that uh, he could cause a disaster if he was wrong. The rain's beating down, the storm's coming one after another, and the meteorologists disagreeing on day to day on whether to go or not to go. It would have been almost impossible to continue to hide that force, and once a force like that would have gotten exposed on a pending assault, it could have been ripped apart by the German Air Force. You can't keep a secret like that forever. Eisenhower did some hand-wringing, his forecasters did some hand-wringing, the entire staff was doing hand-wringing over this. In a final meeting less than 24 hours before the scheduled attack, the weather team told Eisenhower that the rains would let up the morning of June 6th. With that, the Supreme Allied Commander stood up and said, Okay, we'll go. 
Germans thought it was too stormy, and so they were not on alert on that day. He took what we call in the military a prudent risk. He gambled and he won. Two weeks later, when they thought the second best time to uh, launch uh, the invasion of Europe uh, ended up being some of the worst storms they'd ever seen in the channel. If D-Day had failed, the most important campaign of the war would have ended. It would have probably led to a German victory in World War II. When the Battle of Normandy was over, nearly half a million soldiers from both sides were missing, wounded, or dead. But the liberation of Europe had begun. This unconditional surrender has been achieved by teamwork to every subordinate that has been in this command of almost five million allies, I owe debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. In late August of 2005, so many of us had our world forever changed by a storm. Even as a native of New Orleans who's seen the destruction of Katrina firsthand, it's still difficult for me to comprehend the physical and emotional damage it inflicted on the Gulf Coast. Perhaps the only thing more amazing than the fury of that hurricane's wrath has been the determined spirit of the region's people to not only survive, but rebuild. From Biloxi, through Waveland, through Bay St. Louis, through Gulfport, through New Orleans. Complete shock at what Mother Nature had done. We knew it would happen someday. To me, it's still the saddest thing that I've ever had to cover. When Hurricane Katrina reached Category 5 status off the coast of Louisiana on Saturday, August 27th, it was the doomsday scenario forecasters had feared for decades. Although downgraded to Category 4 and later to Category 3 strength, Katrina slammed into the Mississippi Gulf Coast on Monday with a vengeance. You just had storm surge coming in, whacking buildings. Tremendous surge, approaching 30 feet. It was unbelievable down there seeing mammoth casinos picked up out of the water and dropped on the street. The Gulf of Mexico moved in about two miles. I've seen a lot of damage from a lot of hurricanes in the 34 years I've been at the National Hurricane Center. And quite frankly, I went back to the hotel room and uh, cried that night. While the Mississippi Gulf Coast bore the brunt of Hurricane Katrina's winds and surge, New Orleans residents hoped its slight eastward turn had saved them from the worst. Monday morning, suddenly the storm weakened just enough and veered just enough that, that the blow was not quite as direct as it could have been, and it looked as if they were going to get through it. And then, of course, the levees broke and, and everything changed. The flooding that you saw almost exclusively was not supposed to happen. It's a man-made disaster here in New Orleans, and it was done on good intentions. The Army Corps of Engineers wanted to save people and help people. They just built bad levees. If the levee system would have held up, the disaster in New Orleans itself would not have happened. Once the levees were breached, the city began rapidly filling with water. What followed was a life-or-death drama played out on national television. To sit there and watch people drowning on live television and homes just being destroyed, cars on top of homes and flipped over and refrigerators on top of homes. There's, there are no words that can describe what it's like to see that with your own eyes. TV doesn't give you the smell of death. It doesn't give you the stench that comes when everything is mixed together in this like, toxic brew of flood water. When relief didn't arrive quickly for thousands trapped in the New Orleans Superdome and Convention Center, tension within the city began to heat up. By the time Lieutenant General Russell Honore and the National Guard appeared on the scene, New Orleans was on the verge of exploding. You talk about a knight in shining armor, he was that and more. He not only helped restore order, but restored sanity. What we had was a bunch of tired, poor people just wanting to leave. And to see the little babies who basically can't figure out what's going on, but they know they are miserable as all heck. And you know you wanted to get this job done. You wanted to get it done quick, and you wanted to get it done safely. Katrina's this dividing mark, and the city will never be the same, that the spirit is gone from the city. A new spirit could come back, but it's, it's a work in progress. Hurricane Katrina marked a dividing line, not only for New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, but for America as well. When you put an $80 billion price tag on it, it doesn't begin to tell the real tale of how much it's cost the United States. When we return, the number one moment on our countdown. The 100 biggest weather moments will be right back. The 99 moments leading up to this point have been events that have taken place in the past. But our number one moment is about our present and our future. 
It's happening right now, all around us, and it has the potential to drastically alter the lives of every man, woman, and child on Earth. Someone said recently that with global warming, the sting is in the tail. So, you know, the worst is yet to come in many ways. As the Earth warms, we will have more extremes in all aspects of weather. Regarding heat, there will be more heat waves. There will be more extreme heat waves. The increasing incidence of heat waves, of uh, intense storms, of precipitation. More frequent droughts and forest fires. Ice is melting all around the planet. There's no doubt that the sea surface temperatures are increasing. Uh, the sea level is slowly but surely rising. The Greenland ice sheet has begun melting faster than expected. And the long-term melting of the Antarctic ice sheet is also of concern, since half of the world's population lives within 50 miles of a coastline. Each of those events individually could raise sea level by around 20 or 25 feet, and that would be disastrous. That would end coastal civilization as we know it. We keep looking for that element that makes it the story of the day, but it really is the story of the century. In 1958, American scientist Charles David Keeling began measuring the concentration of the gas carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. His exceptionally precise measurements gathered over many years on Mauna Loa, a volcano in Hawaii, first alerted the world to rising levels of greenhouse gases. His famous graph, known as the Keeling Curve, established without a doubt that global warming was in the world's future. The importance of these benchmark observations, like the uh, carbon dioxide record in Mauna Loa, just can't be overstated. There are observations that are so uh, firmly rooted in physics and uh, so precise and so accurate that nobody can question them. If we run these models out for another 100 years, that we're going to see uh, climate that hasn't been here for hundreds of thousands of years. The only way we can see the warming that we've seen over the past 40 years is if we add greenhouse gases. It's very clear, it's stunning. The greenhouse problem exists because humans are contributing to a buildup of these gases. We're causing a thickening of the blanket and that inevitably must warm Earth. In fact, it already has. Since 1970, the Earth has warmed by one degree Fahrenheit, an increase that's already causing profound changes to our planet. Climate experts across the globe are predicting at least an additional three to seven degree rise in temperature by the end of the century, enough to potentially cause a climate catastrophe unprecedented during human existence. As citizens of this incredible and beautiful planet, everything we do has a ripple effect. The two things that I think are most important are sea level change and the extinction of species, because both of those are irreversible for all practical purposes. We are all part of the problem, so we all have to be part of the solution. The long-term solution to the greenhouse gas problem is to find alternative fuels that are clean. Solar, wind, and biomass energy are all candidates. Short-term solutions are mainly addressed at the two biggest greenhouse emitters, electric power plants and cars. By reducing electricity and gasoline consumption, the goal is to level off the warming trend. What I don't want to see happen is that we get to a point where our kids say to us, you know, what did you know? When did you know it? And what did you do? We can't wait on this. We can't wait on this for the sake of our kids and for the sake of our grandkids. We have to start working on it right now. We are all stewards of this earth, and it's up to each of us to keep it healthy. From everyone here at the Weather Channel, I'm Harry Connick, Jr. Thanks for watching.